Uh, when we talk about Islam, um, as you uh, mentioned here, uh, things that come up, uh, I just uh, say here, Muslims, Ramadan, Hijab, Arabs, five pillars, Kaaba, the Kaaba, the cube, right? The, the, the sanctuary of Muslims where they would uh, direct their prayer toward. So that's, you know, Muslims, that's a center of Muslim uh, prayer. Uh, the Kaaba, the cube in the city of Mecca in today's Saudi Arabia. The Quran, yeah, one of your friends say the Quran, uh, says the Quran, that's the scripture. Uh, we talk about the Buddhist scripture, Hindu scriptures, Muslim scriptures. The main Muslim scripture is called the Quran or Quran. Indonesia, that's uh, one of the, um, you know, countries in Asia, in Southeast Asia, where uh, the, um, the, the majority are Muslims. Uh, they are non-Arabs. Uh, of course, you have Arab Muslims there, but you're mostly non-Arabs who con have converted to Islam. Uh, all right, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the Prophet of Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad is the, the Prophet that Muslim believe is the last Prophet, uh, generally speaking. All right, so at least some of you already have some, you know, awareness about what Islam uh, might in entail. Uh, let's talk about this uh, one, uh, one by one, and we'll go from there if you have more questions. All right. Thank you for your um, responses. Uh, when I ask you what comes to your mind when Islam, the word Islam is mentioned. Let me uh, share uh, my screen. And right. So Islam in Southeast Asia um, is very diverse and dynamic. Uh, there is no one monolithic Islam in the whole world, just like there is no one monolithic Buddhism in the whole world or Hinduism or indigenous religions, you know, uh, very diverse, very dynamic. Um, it is in history. It is also in the present time. Uh, I have here uh, pictures of, uh, you know, the fasting month, uh, Muslims uh, eating uh, when they break their fast uh, in the month of Ramadan. Uh, coincidentally, we are now uh, in the month of Ramadan. So Muslims have started uh, fasting since a few days ago uh, until about 28, 29 days from, um, from, from down to sunset, yeah? From sunrise to sunset. So, and sun, you know, sun, sundown to sunset, it, it varies in terms of hours, how many hours they actually are fasting. Uh, meaning they are not eating, not drinking, and if they are husband and wife, they are not having sex in, in during the fasting time. Uh, so that's, uh, generally speaking, uh, in America, for example, Muslim are fasting uh, from around uh, 4.30 or 4.50 a.m. until uh, 7.30 p.m., just an example, uh, and many other places could be uh, fast longer or shorter depending on their time. Uh, in the different countries. In Southeast Asia, uh, Ramadan is celebrated um, and it's a, it's a man of uh, devotion to the divine, to God, and also reading the Quran, the scripture, uh, also family time, uh, and so on. All right, so this is a boy, a Muslim boy reading the Quran. And the Quran uh, is in Arabic, uh, has to be in Arabic in order to be called the Quran. Uh, unlike some other scriptures that uh, are translations uh, in different languages, uh, sometimes are uh, also called uh, either the Bible or, or the Bhagavad Gita or, or uh, uh, Red Veda or, or an other, an other, uh, other uh, texts. Um, in the case of Islam, the Quran has to be in Arabic because Muslims believe that God speak uh, you know, to the Prophet uh, Muhammad 
uh, in Arabic and, and that language has to be preserved as it is uh, or as it was as they believe uh, so that they can still relate to the original text and they give meanings to it. They recite, they learn how to read it and then they recite uh, the Quran and this is one of the scriptures that has traveled around the world, meaning from its origin in, in, in the city of Mecca and Medina to uh, Southeast Asia included. So I'm going to talk about the origins, the texts, uh, doctrines of Islam, and then the transmission of Islam to Southeast Asia today. Uh, maybe we can discuss also uh, uh, Sufism, uh, one of the uh, aspects of Islam, the tradition of Islam that uh, has played a major role in the process of making Southeast Asia uh, Islamic. We call uh, the origin of Islam uh, the Middle East today. Uh, the Middle East uh, is a new name, is modern name uh, during the World War II or after that uh, by the Westerners, of course. Um, uh, but uh, it is the uh, Jazeera Al Arabiya, which means the Arabic, uh, you know, uh, lands. Uh, so mostly Arabic, um, and the Middle East also sometimes would include North Africa, uh, such as uh, Egypt and and Morocco, for example. Um, and this Middle East is again a political and geographical name uh, that today people uh, have used. Uh, the origin of Islam, to be uh, precise, uh, are the cities. Uh, first is the city of Mecca here, yeah. Uh, and then the second city is called Medina. Uh, Medina, the city of the Prophet. Uh, this is the city of Mecca where Muhammad was born. The Prophet was born, uh, and he preached uh, his, uh, you know, Islam uh, to uh, his followers. His, uh, you know, the audience in the city of Mecca, including his relatives, then they moved to the city of Medina and then built a society uh, of Muslims there in Medina until he passed away. But I'll talk more about that. These two, uh, two cities are very important, considered uh, holy cities, um, you know, by Muslims around the world today, including Muslims in Southeast Asia. As you can see here, uh, you know, um, you have a Red Sea, Arabian Sea, and Persian Gulf. Uh, so this is quite strategic, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the regional uh, strategic, in other words, uh, somewhere in the, in the centers of uh, great uh, civilizations. Uh, dates, uh, it's one of the f popular fruits uh, coming out of the Middle East. Uh, by way of illustration, uh, dates uh, have uh, have become also an important, you know, fruits uh, everywhere when Middle Easterns uh, leave or travel, including California, where uh, here you also have uh, planted uh, dates, um, and uh, it grows. Uh, they grow quite. They grow quite uh, well here in in California. They originated from the Middle East. And then you have here the the cube, the Kaaba, yeah, the Kaaba, the cube uh, sanctuary is a is a is a building uh, believed to be built by uh, another prophet of Islam before Muhammad, uh, long uh, uh, several thousands years before Muhammad, uh, uh, by the name of Abraham, or in Arabic Ibrahim. So in 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 the Bible, uh, Abraham or uh, Abraham. Uh, Abraham or Abraham was uh, the prophet of Islam, one of the earliest prophets of Islam, uh, and his sons, uh, Ismail and Isaac, uh, you know, if you know history, or bib uh, biblical history, you would know this, these names, and Muslims believe that through the line of Ismail, the other son of Abraham, uh, that this cube was built. So in other words, this cube was built by Abraham and Ismail. Um, according to the beliefs. And then uh, this has become the center of uh, Islam, meaning that Muslims would uh, worship to God 
toward this. Uh, in other words, they don't worship the cube, they don't worship the, the sanctuary, the building, but they worship God, only that they would direct uh, the prayer into this center, this point. Um, then you have camel. Of course, camel is one of the uh, cattle or animals that uh, also play a role in the process of early Islamization in the city, uh, in the desert, uh, as we know. But of course, today Islam has become so uh, different from the times uh, of the early, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming or arrival of Islam in uh, in 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 the Middle East. <clears throat> When we talk about scripture, yeah, when we talk about scripture, we need to understand the Quran in light of other scriptures. Uh, so the Quran means uh, the recited one. The Quran means uh, recitation. The Quran means reading. Uh, literally, it means to recite it. I mean, to, uh, to, to be recited or the recited one. Uh, the recited one or recitation. So the Quran is a recitation, uh, and it is believed uh, to be uh, revealed to Muhammad, uh, a man born in the city of Makkah, uh, and he proclaimed the, uh, the Quran, uh, the scripture, the main revelation, the revelation that he received from God through uh, angels, um, in this case, the angel, uh, Archangel Gabriel. So, um, and then you have uh, the Quran uh, proclaiming itself as the continuation of the previous scriptures. Uh, in fact, the Quran confirms the truths of the scriptures before the Quran, including uh, uh, the Torah, or Taurat in Arabic, uh, Zabur uh, in Arabic, or a Psalm uh, attributed to David and a gospel uh, in Jil in Arabic uh, revealed to Jesus uh, or in Arabic or in the Quranic term uh, Isa al-Masih. Um, so then you have also uh, manuscripts or uh, revealed books uh, given to Abraham and other prophets. In other words, the Quran was not the only uh, scripture for Muslims. The Quran was the last and the final uh, scripture, but it confirms and refined, add and corrected some of the uh, uh, scriptures before. Uh, so it, it, cl it claimed itself as the final revelation uh, from God to the prophet named Muhammad in Mecca and in Medina. Okay, so this is uh, to suggest that Islam sees itself uh, in line of the uh, Semitic or uh, Semitic, uh, how would you uh, pronounce, uh, you know, uh, Semit or Semite, uh, you know, civilizations, yeah, uh, in what we call uh, Middle East. So Judaism, uh, then Christianity, then Islam, how, you know, it, uh, these different religions uh, continue uh, and continue until today. So there's a continuation. Uh, of the biblical tradition uh, in the forms of Islam and in the forms of the Arabic uh, prophet uh, Muhammad, who then later on becomes the prophet of the mankind as Muslims believe. So the Quran uh, itself, uh, it, it's, a, it's a scripture that uh, contains different topics. Um, Maybe um, we can say uh, five uh, topics. Uh, when we talk about you know, the Tripitaka, uh, the, the Buddhist scriptures, Buddhist uh, basket, for example, talks about Vinaya Pitaka, Sutta Pitaka, Abhidhamma Pitaka, right? It talks about different contents uh, with regard to uh, the, the teachings, the Dharma of the Buddha and the monastic order and so on. Um, in, uh, in philosophical teachings of the Buddha, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, Quran uh, has belief uh, in God and belief in the hereafter. 
uh, as the main belief system or the main belief. Uh, uh, you have Muslims uh, in the early time uh, in the city of Mecca were uh, invited by Muhammad to believe that God exists, uh, one God exists, and the only God exists, and believe that uh, the other gods uh, and goddesses, the daughters of God, that the people of the time had worshipped were not true gods. So Muslims try to reform this belief uh, of you know in different gods and goddesses in in the city of Mecca uh, and change or introduce uh, not a new name Allah A L L A H. All right, that's, uh, please mute yourself uh, if you have something over there. So you are not, uh, you know, uh, disturbing others. Uh, I'm sorry uh, for now. Okay. I heard some, uh, a noise of voice or something. All right. Okay, let me continue. So I believe in one God, right? So uh, people in, in Arabia had worshipped different gods uh, and goddesses. And then uh, they also worship this God called uh, Allah. So the name Allah, A-L-L-A-H, had been there even before Muhammad introduced. Okay, So the name of Allah will, had been there. But then Muhammad tried to uh, you know, reform this. You, you, you worship Allah, this supreme God, but you also worship other tribal or your tribal gods and goddesses. Now get rid of these tribal gods and goddesses. Just worship this one God. So in other words, believe in only one God. This is the reform that Muhammad tried to introduce, okay? Um, in other words, you, you only worship this one God, the true creator, the protector, the destroyer of the world, and the humans, and so on and so forth. So this uh, belief in one God is one key uh, thing that Muhammad tried to introduce. Then secondly, believe in the hereafter. Believe in the hereafter, in other words, uh, the world will end, the idea of the end of the world, right? So Muslims uh, in the early time uh, were invited, or the people there uh, were invited to, uh, to believe that uh, this world uh, would last and would last only until a certain point when, uh, when, when God uh, you know, uh, say that this is the time to end uh, the world, and that's a call the hereafter, after that, the hereafter. So you have this world and the hereafter. Uh, remember, we talk about uh, reincarnation, right? In other religious tradition, right? Uh, so in other words, uh, you have multiple lives, right? Multiple lives, uh, rebirth, right? Samsara and so on. Uh, generally speaking, most Muslims would say that there is no reincarnation. So in other words, there is only one time now in this world and then the world will end and that's the time when everybody will be judged according to their actions in this life and either they will go to you know uh, paradise or hell or in between you know reward and punishment so muslim believe in the uh, in the in the doctrine of rewards and punishments but we'll talk more about that but belief is one of the things that you will find in the quran okay second is ritual so ritual meaning how to worship this one god and how to do you know perform certain um, repetitive acts, uh, daily life, uh, monthly or weekly, uh, and also monthly and yearly. So you have different rituals like prayer, for example, most Muslims, in, mostly um, in you know, uh, the Sunni, and we'll talk more about the Sunni later, uh, the mainstream Muslims, about 80% 80, 80 of Muslims today uh, would pray five times a day, for example. Uh, but you have also the Shiite uh, would pray three times a day, or some also worship uh, or pray two times a day, daytime and then evening time. But uh, the, the main thing is that worship or ritual prayer uh, is in the Quran. And then you also have fasting, one of the rituals, the fasting, meaning you're not you know, abstaining from eating, drinking, uh, and having sex for the, for the couples, from the married couples. Uh, that's also one of the rituals that they would do. 
another type of ritual i will talk more later okay but rituals is in the quran then you have stories and history so stories about other prophets stories about not so much about muhammad the quran doesn't really talk about muhammad uh, so some some people you know uh, say that the quran is about muhammad uh, no the quran is about many prophets uh, muhammad is one of them uh, and the last as muslims believe but you also have uh, moses the stories about moses in the quran okay you also have stories about abraham you also have the stories about children of uh, israel children of israel for example you also have uh, stories uh, about uh, jesus yeah in the quran uh, you have stories about uh, virgin mary in the quran one of the chapters of the quran uh, is named after virgin mary it's called maryam so it's a mary so that's one of the chapters of the quran um, and you also have uh, other prophets uh, beside them uh, so these stories are not so, so much about histories, but about lessons. What lessons uh, the, the, the believers uh, of Muhammad uh, should take uh, based on the stories uh, of the previous prophets and also the previous communities, the previous peoples uh, who either rejected the prophets or uh, accepted the prophets. So the stories, uh, you know, if they um, rejected the prophets of Moses, if they rejected the prophet of Jesus, if they rejected the prophet of Abraham, and I mean, you know, other prophets, then that what happens to them, for example. So those uh, stories are mentioned uh, in the Quran uh, as a lesson, uh, not as a historical, you know, detail. So you don't really have details um, in the Quran. <clears throat> All right, that's then. Point number three. And point number four that you can find in the Quran is ethics. So how to act in this life, um, you know, uh, toward God, toward parents, toward neighbors, toward relatives, uh, toward the poor, the needy. So ethics uh, is very important in the Quran. Uh, also ethics of patience, uh, ethics of generosity, um, you know, charity, uh, ethics of courage, uh, and also justice and compassion, all these ethics, uh, ethical teachings you can find in the Quran, as also in other scriptures uh, in other religions. Also in the context of uh, the, you know, the Arabic, uh, Arabic cultures, of course. Then you also have peoples and other religions uh, like Christians and Jews, the peoples uh, of Judaism, the peoples who had books, uh, Jews, Christians, and uh, Sabi'un, the, the different uh, meanings of Sabi'un, but you also have these peoples, uh, you know, uh, mentioned uh, and described uh, in the Quran. So these uh, are what you can find in the Quran. Yeah, if you have any question about the Quran, uh, you are welcome to, uh, of course, ask in the chat, and I'll, I'll respond to it. <laughs> And then, um, um, just to give you uh, an example of how the Quran, uh, you know, uh, feels or looks like, uh, it's in Arabic, uh, so you will always have uh, the Quran in Arabic. Uh, but in the, in the, our Western context, uh, English-speaking uh, countries, you would find also English translation. Yeah. So, for example, you have the Quran in Arabic, and then you have the side, uh, the translation in English. But you can also have the Quran in Chinese, you know, translation, in uh, Vietnamese, in Malay, in uh, Filipino, in Urdu, in different, you know, local languages as translation of the Quran, not the Quran. So the translation of the Quran and then the Quran itself, okay? And <laughs> And you can uh, Google, you can search using the many search engines to find the Quran in English or in Arabic or in any other languages. Uh, all mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other. Verily, the most honor of you in the sight of Allah. Allah is the God that Muslims use 
for the name, okay? That's the term A-L-L-A-H. Um, so God, uh, usually in capital G, uh, in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. And God has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. This is the chapter name, Al-Hujurat, Chambers, uh, verse 13. So this is one of the chapters. Yeah, so this is an example. Uh, it, this is about, you know, the creation of peoples into uh, men and women and into nations and tribes so that they may know each other, so that they can collaborate. And then the best of these peoples consider uh, the most righteous of them in the sight of their God. Another chapter, just to give you a sense of how the, you know, the, uh, how the Quran uh, uh, means to Muslims. This is the, the beginning chapter, yeah? The beginning chapter, Al-Fatiha, chapter, the opening uh, of the Quran. Most Muslim would memorize this in Arabic and then they would understand in their languages. In the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful, praise be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the world. Most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment, thee do we worship and thine aid we seek. Show us the straight path, the way of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy grace, those whom fortune is not right, and go, and who, go, who do not astray. Yeah, that's uh, who do not astray. This is a prayer, right? The, the believers, the Muslims would pray uh, when they pray or when they recite the Quran. And, you know, they name the God Allah and then Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most gracious and the most merciful, uh, the world, you know, um, um, they praised God and then, um, you know, and then they ask for, for, uh, for uh, uh, they ask God to show them the straight path and so on and so forth. Anyway, this is a prayer that Muslim, uh, Muslim recite. Uh, usually in the, in the prayer times, five times a day for many Muslims, but when they also read the Quran and they would also recite this chapter, the first chapter of the Quran. So you have seven verses. This is the first chapter of the scripture of Islam. All right. Um, so far, so good. Uh, let me check if there is any uh, question so far. Okay. No? All right. Let me continue then. Now, uh, after we talk about the scripture, yeah, the, the Quran. Uh, let's talk about the, some of the key teachings of Islam. You know, in Buddhism, we talk about the Four Noble Truths, right? Uh, suffering, you know, uh, the, the, the cause of suffering, uh, there is an end to suffering, there's the path to end suffering. In, um, in the Hindu tradition also, we have some uh, doctrines or some teachings of different traditions. Um, in Islam, generally speaking, you can um, uh, say uh, three things. Belief, uh, ritual, uh, worship, and then ethics. Uh, three parts of Islamic teachings. Like, the, you know, like just the basic things. So Muslim would have some faith, some belief. Uh, and then uh, according to this belief, they worship, they pray. And then this worship um, is for also uh, demonstrating the ethics uh, toward God as well as toward other humans and uh, in even the, uh, the natural uh, environments. So the nature, the natural world. So the ethics toward other uh, human beings and other uh, God's creation. And nature, belief, ritual, ethics, three things that we can say the teachings of Islam. Okay, let's talk one by one in terms of belief, right? In on top of faith. So in in other tradition that we already discussed, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, like Hindus would believe uh, gods or goddesses. And also uh, some or many believe in worship only one God uh, among Saivite or Vaisnavite, right? Those who worship Shiva, those who worship Vishnu. And Buddhists, we already talked about, you know, belief in God is not an important thing. Even 
Buddhists would consider themselves non-theists. They don't necessarily worship God or one, you know, like a, a supreme creator God uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of Buddhism, if, even though many Buddhists do worship some gods or goddesses uh, according to the uh, cultures in different places and so on and so forth. But as a, as a, as a principle, uh, Buddhism uh, doesn't really uh, talk about uh, worshiping one god. So um, in Islam, uh, as in Judaism and Christianity, god or deity uh, is central. And, and in belief in one God is central uh, doctrine in Islam. Belief in only one God. <clears throat> the one and only God, according to Muslims. And then Muslims believe in angels. Yeah, angels, um, you know, uh, celestial beings uh, cre created by God, uh, assist assisting God in terms of uh, taking care of the world, uh, you know, helping uh, the revelation conveyed to the prophets, like uh, Archangel Gabriel, for example, to Muhammad, you know, all assistant of God. We can call assistant of God uh, created, uh, who always uh, were and are obedient to God. So angels are always obedient to God. So Muslim believe in the existence of this unseen, uh, the unseen create, uh, creation of God. Then they also need to believe in all prophets. So the Muslims do not only believe in Muhammad as the prophet of God, according to the Quran. Uh, they also, uh, as a Muslim, are uh, invited to uh, to wish, uh, to uh, believe in the existence uh, of all prophets, including Solomon, David, uh, you know Abraham, Moses, Jesus, uh, and there are some twenty-five prophets mentioned in the Quran and countless other prophets unmentioned or not mentioned in the Quran that Muslim also should believe that they exist before Muhammad. All right, so believe in the other prophets beside Muhammad. And number four, believe as, as that prophet. Then you have also believe in revelation on the scriptures. So the Quran was, uh, or, or considered, the Quran is considered the scripture of Islam, but the Quran also confirmed the truths of other other revelations, other scriptures, including the you know I already mentioned the Psalm attributed to David, uh, uh, you know Injil uh, or Gospels, um, uh, and and uh, and others Torah for example to Moses. So believe in those truths as well as the Quran. Then believe in the day of judgment. So Muslims believe that there will be a day of judgment, you know, after everybody, whole things, whole worlds end, then there will be a time where everyone will be judged according to their actions in the world. Believe in good decrees and bad decrees. That's basically Muslims believe that God uh, has, uh, you know, determined every single thing in this world, every single creation, uh, its own measure. So natural laws um, are actually laws of God. What we consider as the, the, the law of nature is the law of God. Uh, in other words, God already decreed that things uh, you know, operate according to the laws. Muslims are invited to also believe in that, that God uh, give his decrees to everything, every single thing of his creation. All right, so believe in one God, believe in angels, believe in prophets, believe in the scriptures, believe in the day of judgment, believe in good and bad decrees, you know, according to some of the Muslims, uh, especially the last one. There are some discussion and debate about this sixth pillar. All right, uh, so that's, a, that's a, the pillars of faith, yeah? The, the, the belief part, the faith part, the faith dimension, of uh, Muslim uh, around the world. Um, any questions so far about belief? If you have any uh, question before I continue? All right, I just wanna check uh, chat. All right, let's move on. If not, then you have the pillars of worship. Yeah, so they believe and then now they worship. So worship uh, or, or you know ritual in our language, uh, ritual, something that they do repeatedly, 
like you know like maybe daily or weekly monthly or annually one of the main uh, pillars of islam it is called uh, shahada mean proclamation of faith uh, this is very interesting uh, and, and important for for uh, the converts especially converts those who convert to islam so they would proclaim there is no god but one god and muhammad is his messenger or his prophet of, of uh, it's a, his prophet or god's prophet so the, to declare that god is one and then muhammad is his messenger uh, is considered the proclamation so they fit so when you are uh, when you ask you know so how to become a muslim or like how to become a buddhist how to become a hindu and so on uh, there are certain things right uh, ritually speaking they would uh, declare they would say uh, maybe in, in front of a religious uh, leader or religious you know uh, teacher um, there is no god but one god and uh, muhammad is his messenger you become a muslim so become a muslim is just that um you know uh, proclamation uh, that's the number one number two pray so they they would pray they would pray in uh, usually in arabic uh even in southeast asia you would uh, find uh, most muslims pray in arabic in fact every single muslim would pray in arabic uh, regardless of their nationality and ethnicity even though they are non-arabs they learn how to pray in arabic and then they try to understand the meanings of the recitation in their prayers they uh, and of course it takes education and stuff you know learning and so on but uh, as a matter of tradition they would pray in arabic and then that's an in a formal time like five times a day but they also pray in their local languages uh, in malay in in you know in uh, in charm language in uh, in in chinese language if they are chinese muslim in southeast asia or Indians or in other languages, they would pray also in local languages uh, besides the, the five times. So they can still pray uh, anytime uh, what they ask God uh, to help them, for example. And then they pray, uh, they ask God in their local languages. So Arabic prayers are only in the formal times, okay? But beyond that, they can pray uh, in any language that they understand and they mother tongue. That's number two, prayer. Number three, the the third pillar of his, uh, of of Islam of the worship of Islam is zakah or almsgiving. So they would do charity. They would give some portion of their income uh, to the poor and the needy. Um, you know, um, it's a it's a form of uh, uh, or a, an act of charity or an act of compassion among Muslims to give a portion of their uh, wealth. Uh, you know, 2.5%, uh, generally speaking, uh, of the income uh, to, uh, to be distributed to the poor and to the needy and other uh, recipients of the almsgiving, the alms, zakat. And then you have fasting, yeah? That's the fourth pillar, uh, fasting, meaning they are abstaining uh, from, from eating, from drinking, from having sex, from... Uh, saying bad words uh, during uh, the times uh, of the fasting uh, in the months of Ramadan. That's the uh, obligatory fasting for Muslims who are able, who are healthy, who are not elderly, who are not uh, nursing, who are not pregnant, uh, who are not traveling. So if a if Muslim travels or if Muslim is sick, let's say you know, during this COVID-19 you know, crisis, the Muslims are sick, um, you know, ill, then they are exempt from fasting. They are not supposed to fast. But if they are healthy um, and, uh, you know, uh, they are uh, required to fast from dawn to uh, sunset during the months of Ramadan. Just an example. Um, then you have the pilgrimage. Uh, they travel or pilgrimage, they uh, visit uh, the, the cube, the Kaaba, the one that I show you in the beginning, right in the present day Saudi Arabia, in the city of Mecca, uh, they do this pilgrimage in order to commemorate the history of Islam, to commemorate uh, Abraham and Ismail, uh, and they would also visit the, the graves uh, uh, of the prophets and so on and so forth. 
as a, a symbol of unity uh, of, uh, of Muslims around the world. So five pillars, right? Proclamation of faith, prayer, almsgiving, fasting, and pilgrimage. Yeah? All right. Uh, let me check if you ha have any question. Um, all right. So one by one, uh, uh, I already mentioned uh, briefly uh, each of the pillars, but let's uh, you know have some uh, more uh, introduction to this. So Muslim would proclaim the faith, right? Usually um, um, before an imam, an imam means religious leader, religious teacher. Uh, so you have this uh, example of Muslim converting to Islam, and then. Um, then you have this Arabic, uh, right? Arabic uh, calligraphy. Uh, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's in Arabic. Uh, which means uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So this is considered the proclamation of faith. And then you have a logo of uh, organization that might include the shahada. They might include the proclamation of faith. Like an Islamic organization in Indonesia here, uh, one of the uh, Islamic organizations in Indonesia uh, is called uh, Muhammadiyah, uh, the followers of Muhammad. And in the logo of this organization, uh, you have the Shahada uh, in Arabic. Yeah, uh, I proclaim that there is no God but Allah or God but God. And, Muhammad, and I proclaim that Muhammad is the messenger of God. All right, just an example, the use of the shahada, the, the proclamation in the logo of an organization in Southeast Asia. Yeah, this one, okay? And here the proclamation of faith, sometimes you can find also in the flags, yeah, in the flag of uh, organization, uh, or even uh, I believe also in, uh, in some of the uh, uh, national flags, uh, but I, I, I have to double check the Saudi, uh, you know, the Saudi uh, flag, uh, how does it look like? Um, but anyway, there's some uh, Arabics uh, in some of the flags, at least some of the organizations. So that's a procl proclamation uh, part. Then you have the prayer, right? So the prayer is something that the Muslim would do uh, repeatedly, repeatedly, you know, in repetition uh, every day, for example. So this is the movement that they would do. Uh, when we talk about meditation in Buddhism, uh, you know, uh, there are different kind of, there are different, um, different uh, kinds of meditation, right? And when we talk about puja in Hinduism, uh, you know, the act of uh, devotion to the, to the God, or, uh, you have different, different body movement, right? Different, um, uh, different body movement involved in this prayer. In Muslim prayer, uh, you would have uh, three major movements. Fro one is standing, yeah, one is standing, and then you have uh, bowing, yeah, and then you have uh, uh, prostration, right? Prostration, where your forehead uh, is on the ground. So that's how Muslims, men and women, would pray, uh, standing, bowing, and then, uh, you know, uh, putting your uh, forehead, uh, touching your forehead into the ground, on the ground. So this uh, symbolizes, uh, you know, especially the prostration symbolizes the humility of a Muslim as human being, as the creation, as the creation of, of the divine. So, you know, humility, the sense of humility uh, that they want to show to God, that God is the, you know, the greatest and then uh, Muslims or believers uh, consider themselves, uh, you know, in the humility by uh, bowing and then prostration, you know, performing the prostration, um, putting your forehead on the ground. So this is the prayer, how they move, how they do the movement, uh, five times a day, at different times, every, every single time that they pray. But that's just to give you a sense of how Muslims pray. Then you also have uh, uh, the meaning of prayer. The meaning of prayer is a reminder. So Muslim believe that uh, human beings are forgetful. Uh, and then to, to pray is to be reminded that 
uh, you know, they believe God is always present, that God always watches them, their action, and so on. So by praying, they always remember the presence of God in their daily life. <clears throat> then when they pray, they also feel a, a sense of uh, peace and tranquility uh, because now they can focus on uh, only God uh, and then, uh, you know, ignoring or neglecting all the worldly uh, affairs, the businesses and everything else, now time to see and communicate with the God. So there's a sense of peace and tranquility when they worship uh, in this uh, type of prayers uh, or salah in Arabic. All right, so prayer in a way compa is comparable to like yoga, right, in Hindu tradition or meditation in Buddhist tradition, you know, to focus, right, to concentrate. Uh, of course, different ways, different goals, different objects uh, toward uh, different objects uh, uh, toward which they, were, they would meditate. Uh, in, the, uh, in the case of Muslims, they would, uh, you know, they would uh, uh, concentrate on the God or they God, uh, the God of creation as they believe. All right, uh, and Muslim uh, would start to pray uh, since they already reached the mature, uh, the puberty, age of uh, puberty. So they start uh, uh, praying, uh, you know, uh, five times a day from, from in many cases. Um, and Muslim uh, children would learn since, you know, the early times in the homes or in schools uh, so that they can learn how to recite the prayers, how to do the movements, right? Um, and then also to understand the meanings of the prayers, uh, which are in Arabic. Um, then if they are Indonesian or Vietnamese or, or, or Thai um, or Singaporean or Malaysians or Filipinos, uh, they have to understand Arabic as well as their own, you know, uh, or languages. In other words, they need to understand the meanings of the prayers in their own mother tongues. That's the, the challenge for Muslims in Southeast Asia, how to understand Arabic in their own cultures, in their own language, or languages, including when they pray, okay? Um, so that's a prayer, the second pillar. And then let's uh, talk a little bit more about fasting. I know I already explained uh, briefly about it. So it is considered obligation uh, or, or, you know, um, a duty, a religious duty to fast during the, the fasting months, uh, uh, Ramadan. Uh, so as you can see here, during the month of Ramadan, um, you know, they are not supposed to eat. They are, they, they, you know, they, uh, uh, they are abs uh, abstain, uh, uh, I mean, they, they control themselves not to drink, uh, you know, yeah, you have here, um, you know, or some ethical uh, things they are not supposed to, or they have to also uh, uh, follow, right? They also show the uh, charity during this time. Because during the fasting month, uh, Muslims believe that they feel solidarity, uh, you know, with the homeless, with the poor, with the needy, who cannot eat or cannot drink, uh, who are poor, who, you know, who don't have food to, uh, and so on. So when they're fasting, they become more, um, you know, uh, more compassionate toward uh, the poor and the needy. That's the idea behind fasting, as Muslims believe. Um, beside the month of Ramadan, as, um, some Muslims, even in Southeast Asia, would also fast, uh, you know, weekly, like Mondays and Thursdays. So they, they perform, so if you, for example, visit a Muslim uh, family or, or society, you know, community in, in Southeast Asia or any other place, you might find someone who is fasting when it comes to a Monday and Thursday. It's a, considered optional. Uh, recommended. Uh, they are not obligations, but um, you know, Muslims uh, still do that. Um, they because they they feel that there's an, uh, there's benefit there's a benefit to 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 fasting. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me show you this. 
Uh, I hope this, uh, oh, that's the video is not available, so maybe it's already. Um, um, outdated the, the link. So I will uh, change that link later on. The next one is zakat, almsgiving, right? Charity, act of charity. So there's two forms uh, that every single Muslim would pay. Uh, would, would, uh, would pay. Uh, it's called uh, zakat fitra, the, uh, every soul you, during the, the month of Ramadan, before the end of the month of Ramadan, they have to fulfill the obligation uh, to give a portion uh, to, to, you know, to be distributed to other Muslims so that everyone will celebrate uh, the end, the festival of the, after the fast. So every single person, including baby, you know, would be paid by their parents if they are not poor, you know, need to pay this. Uh, and then you have uh, the, the uh, it's called the, the charity, the arms of wealth. Uh, it depends on how much that they earn, how much that they have. Uh, generally speaking, 2.5%. But you also have other things, uh, you know, um, other types of property uh, that they also need to uh, to give to uh, you know to others. So, uh, if, uh, oh yes, please, please. Uh, are you are you still supposed to be sharing your screen? Because I don't think we can see anything anymore. Oh, uh, all right. Yes, yeah, sorry, but maybe because of the. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, maybe stop when I. Uh, show you the video. Okay, how about now? Let me check. How about now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so alms giving. So there are two forms. Uh, one is the every single Muslim would pay. All right, regardless of the class, uh, so, you know, social standing and so on, as long as they are still able to do it. But then you also have this second one. Uh, you know, uh, a charity uh, depending on your wealth, uh, how much, how, how little you you own, and then 2.5% uh, of it uh, should be given to the poor and to the needy and to the travelers, to the new converts, you know, to the uh, Islamic mission, to Islamic education, and so on and so forth. There is uh, some details about it, but this is just to give you a sense of, you know, the key uh, main practice uh, across uh, the Muslim uh, societies. All right, last one, but not the least, is the pilgrimage, right? The pilgrimage that they would do like a sacred journey, you know, a sacred uh, journey to uh, to the city, uh, especially Mecca, and then the city of Medina, uh, where you have this cube, the one that I showed you earlier, right? The center of Islam where everybody, usually every year, there are about, you know, two, three million Muslims would gather in this one place called, you know, uh, uh, the masjid in the mosque, yeah, in the mosque, uh, you know, mosque, uh, al Masjid al-Haram in the city of Mecca in the, in the present day uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this to commem this uh, commemorates uh, the prophet of Abraham, remember the story of Abraham and Ismail, right? Uh, so in other words, in, in, as a continuation of the, uh, Semitic cultures and civilizations and religious traditions of monotheistic beliefs. So to commemorate them, and also they would uh, visit uh, the, the, you know, the mosque of the uh, of the prophet, um, and it to show their brotherhood, their unity as a Muslim. In other words, regardless of the you know gender, uh, ethnicity, nationality, uh, they would gather here. So it's a sense of brotherhood a global brother and sisterhood and equality uh, before, you know, God. And they believe that this uh, is the time when they really be close, uh, are close to the God, as well as the, the you know, the sacred uh, sites. And 2.3, you know, two, or 2 to 3 million Muslims would gather here. Unfortunately, yeah, because of the COVID-19, yeah, uh, now it is closed, yeah. So no Muslims would come to this place now in, you know, it's closed now. More, all the mosque, uh, mosque in, uh, in Saudi Arabia today is closed. Uh, so, you know, because of uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic. But anyway, just to give you another context, all right? That could today context. Um, they would come here annually once, once, uh, once a year. But besides once a year, they also can come and have a visit anytime during the year. 
Yeah, it's called Umrah, but anyway, it's called lesser pilgrimage. This is a greater pilgrimage, uh, annual, if they are able to uh, do it. Because Muslims around the world would have to pay, right, to come to Saudi Arabia, you know, from Southeast Asia, you know, they have to pay around uh, $4,000, uh, for example. If you are Muslim in America, you would pay around 8000 to 10000 uh, US dollars to come visit for about, you know, maybe two weeks uh, uh, in this place, all right? Um, and what else about this pilgrimage? Um, well, before, the before they would have to uh, use uh, or, you know, um, ships, right? Like two months of traveling. In Southeast Asia, two months, and not everybody uh, would be able to reach the, the city of Mecca from Southeast Asia, right? Uh, you know, maybe they are sick or they die during the journey. And so there's a very uh, uh, long history. Um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, a journey is a sacred journey. It's a long journey from Southeast Asia to the Middle East, to uh, Saudi Arabia. Anyway, uh, it is a journey. It is a sacred journey, just like pilgrimages for many Jews and Christians to go to uh, Jerusalem, for example. Uh, and for uh, Hindus and Buddhists also would have some pilgrimages, uh, you know, to uh, sacred sites, right? Uh, Muslim have this pilgrimage to uh, the cube uh, in Saudi Arabia. All right. So now uh, I have about uh, uh, 15 minutes left, all right? Uh, I give you time to uh, ask questions about the key, you know, key uh, teachings of Islam and the basic, you know, basic concepts of Islam before we move to Southeast Asia. Uh, if you have any question here, um, into your chat. Okay. How about Islamic banking? Okay, Nathaniel uh, asked about Islamic banking. All right. So um, this is a new uh, development where some Muslims in Saudi Arabia, in in Pakistan, in in Southeast Asia, in Indian Indonesia, in Malaysia, also in in part of Europe and America uh, have. Uh, created what they call an Islamic banking. Islamic banking in their understanding is a free interest banking system. So in other words, uh, you know, they don't have interest. Um, they consider interest as usury, as uh, riba in Arabic term. Uh, usury um, is considered uh, prohibited uh, uh, to, you know, uh, to give charge uh, over uh, the one, over the loans, yeah, charge over the loans, uh, any percentage they consider is prohibited. So that's why they create this Islamic banking system where there is no free, I mean, there is no interest involved, but they still can actually, you know, the banking can still earn some money through other ways like profit sharing. So they, they do a, a kind of profit sharing. For example, uh, a Muslim would, uh, a deposit some, let's say, one thousand, right? And then this one thousand would be uh, used by the bank to produce something, and then they get some profits. Uh, let's say they get profits, um, uh, you know, one hundred dollars, right? So uh, you know, in the contract, so from this profit one hundred, they would share the profit. Um, let's say you know the uh, you know the customer would get uh, you know maybe twenty five dollars and then 75 dollars would go to the bank so it's a profit sharing thing and this is a new phenomenon in order to avoid the you know the interest yeah um okay that's that's part of the, the system economic system that uh, some muslim are establishing now and it becomes a global industry including southeast asia it's a new phenomenon um and then it's uh, you have that as well uh, in, in America as uh, among Muslims who don't want to use the conventional banks system and then they have their own way of, uh, you know, economic transactions, loans, um, and, um, and borrowing and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, 
Um, all right. Um, but Islamic banking is not considered like the five pillars. It's not considered, you know, the five pillars. It's, it's an additional thing with regard to, you know, law, uh, Islamic law or Islamic ethics, uh, economic ethics, uh, with regard to uh, money, with regard to property, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Okay. Uh, any other question? All right. Let's move on, okay? Islam in Southeast Asia. <laughs> Today, before we talk about the transmission of Islam into Southeast Asia, today, you know, 2020, you have uh, um, in Indonesia, you see about 229 million uh, Muslims. Uh, so that's the largest in Southeast Asia and the largest in uh in the world yeah in terms of number you see it uh, 229 millions muslims in indonesia right this is the islands of indonesia about 87 percent of the population 87 percent of the populations are muslims in indonesia um We'll talk more about other religions, uh, and we already talk about other religions, Hinduism and Buddhism in Indonesia before, right? We will also talk about Christianity and Confucianism as well. But Muslims uh, are around 87%. Then you have Malaysia, the neighboring country. Um, oh, sorry, uh, professor. professor, I think your screen's not up again. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why. <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, thank you. Sorry about that, um, but all right, let's, uh, now you can see, um, all right, thank you. Um, all right, here we go, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, 200, uh, 229 million uh, Muslims in Indonesia, and then 22 million Muslims in Malaysia, yeah? about 66 percent and in the philippines we have about uh, you know six million muslims uh six uh, six percent also and then in thailand you have about four million muslims in thailand yeah six percent of the majority buddhist country six percent of the population are muslims in myanmar you have two millions right in vietnam you have about you know almost 200,000 Vietnamese, maybe from, you know, different uh, ethnic groups or even Vietnamese themselves. Uh, we will talk more about that. Um, and then you have other places, you uh, know, uh, uh, very, very small minorities. Uh, in Brunei, it's a small uh, country. Uh, uh, you have uh, about 300,000 Muslims in the country called Brunei Darussalam. And then in Singapore, about 100, uh, 1 million, sorry, 1 million Muslims. So anyway, just to give you a sense how, uh, in terms of numbers, um, and which one, which countries are Muslims majority and which one, which countries are minorities, Muslims are minorities. Yeah. So again, uh, only uh, Indonesia and then Malaysia, uh, Muslim are predominant. Uh, the rest of Muslims are minorities, yeah? In the mainland Southeast Asia, uh, also in the Philippines, the Muslim, uh, Muslims have become a minority population, all right? So I have five minutes left. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the beginnings of Islam in Southeast Asia. When did Islam come to Southeast Asia, right? Uh, if you ask about uh, archaeological and historical evidence uh, evidences, you would find around, you know, the end of the 13th century, yeah, uh, 13th century, uh, in the form of the kingdom, you know, the kingdom, a uh, Muslim kingdom, uh, one uh, famous uh, early kingdom is called uh, Pasai, uh, the kingdom Pasai near Aceh. 
uh, it is in the island of Sumatra, northern tip of Sumatra in Aceh. If I mention Aceh, uh, maybe some of you remember uh, uh, the tsunami, yeah? Uh, tsunami that uh, kills uh, 100,000 uh, people and most of them are, are you know, Achenese. Uh, that's uh, the, the one of the first or the earliest uh, spot of uh, Muslim kingdom, okay? Just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, uh, today's time. So uh, the kingdom of Pasai, and then you have also Muslim tombs uh, uh, have been found in East Asia. So you have the island of Java. Uh, sorry, East Asia, not East Asia. East Java, I meant. Uh, so East Java, uh, Java, the Java island, uh, around 13th century, or some say also earlier than 13th century. So that's uh, one of the, uh, you know, archaeological uh, evidences of, of, of the presence of Muslim. Uh, not much that we can say about this, uh, okay, uh, in this very early time. And Islamization uh, took place uh, slowly, yeah, slowly because why? You know, it, uh, they had become Hindu and Buddhist, right? Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism uh, across Southeast Asia uh, had become quite uh, dominant. So that's why when Islam came, you know, the, the Islamization process was slow and gradual for sure. Um, but the declines of the Hindu Buddhist kingdoms stimulated the expansion of Islam. So when the kingdoms of Majapahit, for example, or Srivijaya, right, um, decline, then you have the, the coming of Muslims and then the conversion of the Mus uh, of the ruler local rulers into Islam, then you have a shift from Hindu Buddhist to Islamic kingdoms in Southeast Asia. Uh, so the decline of Hindu Buddhist kingdoms, uh, you know, stimulated uh, the expansion of Islam in Southeast Asia, particularly in the ma maritime you know, in the islands of East Asia, in, the, in today's Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, you know, a part of Philippines, especially the southern part of Philippines, uh, unlike the mainland Southeast Asia, where you had already predominantly uh, uh, Buddhists, okay? Uh, while uh, the islands, maybe because the islands were separated, isolated, right? The kingdom was not so integrated Right, like in the mainland Southeast Asia, where you already had Buddhist kingdoms there, you know, Islam could not really, you know, encroach itself into mainland Southeast Asia because it's already integrated or already centralized. The kingdoms have become quite strong, Buddhist, uh, you know, kingdoms. While in in the main uh, in island Southeast Asia, right, uh, you tend to have uh, 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 isolated islands. You know how many islands in Southeast Asia? Around. <laughs> around 17 18000 islands you know the islands in in, in indonesia they are around 17000 islands can you imagine 17000 islands and think about 17 i mean uh, 13th centuries 14th centuries a long time ago right they are isolated um, and that's why when the one of the kingdoms become muslim the ruler then you know uh, they had to expand Islam into the other kingdoms, the smaller kingdoms, you know, through treat, through controlling or conquest, and they, uh, you know, and then you had the Islamization process taking place. All right, this is just the beginning of our story of Islamization process. Yeah, uh, we have to end to the this lecture, uh, and I'll continue uh, this lecture on Islam in Southeast Asia on Thursday. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining uh, our lecture today. Uh, you can uh, say here in, uh, in the chat if you haven't so, done so. And I, I still um, read your weekly essays. I know some of you already uh, uh, submitted your essays. Keep doing that. Um, and I will uh, submit uh, my responses to you uh, as, as soon as I can. All right. Thank you again for joining. Um, and stay safe and healthy as always. I hope the crisis will end soon. So <laughs> we all hope. Uh, it is indeed a challenging time for everyone. 
but uh, hanging there and I'll see you again uh, on Thursday. All right. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye, Thank professor. you, Professor. Good night. Thank you so much.